it's it's uh, not that difficult a concept there. So this is very much an analogy with 1D, it's just now we have TX and TY because we're computing transmissibilities in both directions. The key thing to note is that in 1D we just had area here, now the area is actually delta X times H. So H is the thickness into the reservoir, but accounting for potentially um, non-uniform grids in both delta X and delta Y, we have to have that, that there. Okay. If they're all the same, I mean, if it's the reservoir is homogeneous and isotropic and uniform, they're all the same, they all equal T, which equals that. And then we went through these examples. That's just repeating it. In the notes, uh, th this equation is wrong. Um, well, it's half wrong, I guess. If, if, it, if it's going to look like that, you'd have to have minus, minus there. Otherwise, the way we the way we were writing is with minus signs here, plus so the, the left hand side of this equation needs to be multiplied by minus one in the slides. So on the no flow boundary condition, we just write the mass balance. The pressure drop across the no flow is going to be zero, and therefore we get the three T here. Constant pressure boundary condition we talked about just now. And the one I was getting to was when you have two boundaries, you really don't, you just treat them each individually separately, right? Just do what you would do for one boundary, do it again for uh, that. So in, in this case, uh, you get 2t here, but it's also equivalent to the number of neighbors, right? So, you know, we derive this equation via this mass balance, including the fact that there's no pressure to drop across the left-hand boundary, no pressure to drop across the top because there's no flow. You get this equation. But again, it's easy enough to just remember that that is the number of neighbors. And the reason I switched to the slide is because I didn't want to write this matrix down. But there's the total, for the implicit problem, there's the total transmissibility matrix with all the entries computed, and that should look very, very, very familiar. Aside from the five T's. Right. So in your homework, one, you created that matrix. Right? You didn't know why. You were just solving this sort of riddle of connectivity, right? But it turns out that riddle of connectivity is exactly what creates this stencil. Right? Aside from the five T's, right? So the fives show up. So in your homework, where the fives are, you would have had threes, right? Along that right-hand side boundary. But the fives show up due to the fact that there's a constant pressure boundary condition. Right. And of course, you didn't have T's. You had minus ones, right? Or you, T was one in your, in your, uh, in your homework. So, again, when you write the equations in matrix form, right, and so the, the, the idea here is you, you've already written some, a 1D code, you're writing another one on this next homework assignment, and when you, get, when you get the matrices assembled, and then you just go and do your linear solve or whatever, if you're solving an implicit equation, that part of the code is the exact same. It's no different in 1D than it is in 2D. It's just calculating the T matrix right, is the main difference. The B matrix is identical. Right? It's just there's more, more entries because you have more grid blocks. Right? And of course, then the Qs also accounting for the constant pressure boundary condition. You have, in this case, there was no wells, but you had a constant pressure on the right. So you have this 2TB that shows up over there on the far right-hand side. So, if you had a irregular geometry, right, like a reservoir up there in the right hand, so, uh, you know, of course, even 2D, not all reservoirs are perfect rectangles, right? Uh, 
So what we can do is we can superimpose that irregular reservoir onto sort of a background grid, if you will, that, that's larger, right? So, so the background grid there is larger than the reservoir, and you just superimpose that reservoir onto it. And then you just treat the boundaries along the edges of the green as if there are no flow boundary conditions, or essentially you set the permeability of those grid blocks to zero. And then you compute interblock transmissibilities, and that will automatically give you no flow boundaries along the edges. So, uh, and so in that case, you know, if you, if you had something like that, you would get zeros in the in the state in the matrix. Of course, yeah. for this to work, you have to compute the interblock permeabilities with a harmonic mean so that you get zero transmissibility across the boundary. So then, just in summary, uh, what we learned about 2D, uh, we introduced some new indices. We understand that the equations are exactly the same as they were. And 1D, aside from the T matrix, which had the structure, and that structure corresponds to the connectivity, right, and the boundary conditions. Okay. So there's a you know, comment there, no flow boundary conditions are the most common. Some commercial simulators do not even have the option of constant pressure boundary conditions. This is actually very true of the one we use in this class. CMG, uh, unless it's in the very newest release and I don't know about it, CMG does not have the option for a constant pressure boundary condition. Um, we'll, you'll, on Friday, we're going to meet in the computer lab, and you're actually going to solve in CMG one of those four grid block example problems like you've been working on your homework. We're going to solve that in CMG. And one of those has a constant pressure boundary condition on it. So to get CMG to solve that problem, we're going to have to fake it. We're going to have a fifth grid block out there on the end, and we're going to make it really, really tiny, and we're going to set a bottom hole pressure well in it to fix the pressure in that. And it's going to be so small that it's not going to affect, you know, the, the obviously if that grid block was a full-size grid block, that would cause an error, a big error in the solution. But the grid block's going to be so tiny, uh, so narrow, that um, it, the error in the solution over the way the more rigorous way that we implement the constant pressure boundary conditions in our codes uh, will be so small you won't it'll, you won't notice it. I mean, it'll, it'll be in the 16th decimal place. So if you just compare the first five or six decimal places, you should get the exact same answer in CMG as what you get when you write your code. So I'm offering you a way to check your homework because we're going to solve it in CMG, uh, and with some small modifications, you can use that same technique to solve your homework problem, and then you should know if you, you know, if you believe that what you did in CMG is correct, that you get the same uh, answer. So then again, in the codes we're going to write, and again, your, your midterm project is going to be to write a 2D heterogeneous, non-isotropic, non-uniform grid reservoir simulator. And uh, but, but we will have uh, the, the aerial view, right? So we're not going to include effects of gravity. And again, uh, the last thing is, you know, if, you're if your reservoir is not a rectangle, you can fill it with inactive grids. So these are, your, these are grids that are outside the boundary that you would just set the permeability to zero, compute the interblock transmissibility according to the harmonic mean, and you can get no transfer or no flow along the outside. So that's 2D, and we'll uh, stop there.